Happy Friday, and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It's April 1st. I promise we're not going to do any April Fool's jokes. But you know the remarkable thing about it being April 1st, uh, Tim Miller? What's up? Is that it's already April 1st. You know, this is just a kind of a reminder how time is elastic. I mean, sometimes it just drags on forever and ever. And you wake up this morning, and you go, that first quarter of 2022, it's gone. It's in the can. I don't know. Do you have the same? I, I do have the same. Okay. And it's and it's the um, the days are long and the years are short type thing going on for me right now. And it's like I, I, I'm really struggling to come up with things like, you know, anytime I need to write for an article, you know, I mentioned the John Huntsman campaign and the Will Hurd article this week. And I was yeah. like, how many years ago was that? And then uh, you know, like doing the math, I was like, 11? Was it 11 years ago? So I, I, I'm, I'm with you. This year is flying I, by. I, Our last yeah. decade is flying by. I'm getting old. My life is flying by. We're all, death comes for all of us. I regret to tell you that this will get worse. I actually had lunch with a guy the other day. And we were sort of doing the math and I was thinking that, okay, you know, I think I've known you for like, you know, 30 years or something. And he looks at me and he goes, uh, 50, <laughs> 40, 40 years. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, of when you start to do these decades things, it's kind of weird. When I first started doing my talk show, Tommy Thompson was the governor of the state of Wisconsin. And, you know, in the distant mists yeah. of time, he's 81 years old right now. Do you know where he is? He was yesterday. <laughs> I, saw, I saw this. I knew Tommy from uh, uh, in that uh, he, he he threw his hat in the presidential ring, you know, know, one year. I saw him yeah. traipsing around Iowa back in, you know, my youth uh, as a Iowa staffer. I, I do know he was in Mar-a-Lago. Um, I I, Tommy's got to look terrible. I didn't see any pictures. He cannot look good. I and mean, he didn't look good in 2007. I, well, okay, I, let's leave that aside. The, the thing about Tommy <laughs> Thompson is that I, I, I spent several years, uh, many years, uh, underestimating him. And, uh, you know, then having, a, I, I, I think, a reasonably cordial relationship with him. And then later, as I look back on his governorship and his career, became more and more impressed. And, and then we've had a really, really good relationship since then. You know, I, I often, you know, call him on his birthday and stuff like that. Really? Know? And and so when, when there was this buzz that he was thinking of running for governor, I was thinking, hey, run, Tommy, run. And then, of course, he goes down to Mar-a-Lago, which is once again that familiar old feeling like, oh, yeah, she's oh, not that. Well, the interesting thing about Tommy is that he he's kind of gone out on a high. They named him. This is so bizarre. They named him the acting president of the University of Wisconsin system. And he did a great job and to universal praise. Honestly, if anybody would have predicted back in the 1980s that Tommy Thompson would once become, you know, would someday become a university president and would be great at it, nobody would have believed you. It just it's one of those things where don't be sure you have any idea what's going to happen, including him going down to Mar-a-Lago. Could have been named to the King of the Cheese Parade that you guys have every year to, you know, honor the uh, top Wisconsin citizen. So um, do we have Do we have a cheese parade? Or no. you, just, you, just, you just made that up. So <laughs> you didn't. were so you were down at uh, some big Lollapalooza thing in Brazil, was, which is amazing because I figured if you were going to go off on a you know off the hook vacation, that you'd be in Disney World because everything I'm reading about Disneyland. Why are you not at Disneyland? I, I, you see what I I'm doing here? I'm, news. I'm yeah, I do, I, do see where you're, I, I do see where you're here. The Disney. Disney loves yeah. the gays now. Yeah. It took him a while. I mean, back in the old days when I was growing up, you know, th there is this kind of misnomer that Disney didn't have any gay characters because technically they did. Um, you know, the villains, uh, Jafar in Aladdin, he was pretty gay. Uh, Scar, remember Scar in The Lion King? Another bachelor with kind of a lisp, pretty gay. Prince hmm. Prince John, the bad guy in, in in Robin Hood. You know, they never said that they were gay, but you there, there was kind notes. of a trend. Yeah, there was huh. kind of a trend of a of the effeminate bachelor uh, villain. Um, so you know, to give give Disney a little bit of credit there. But besides that, they never had any gay characters. Now all of a sudden, they want some. And uh, people are mad. but And so, you know, obviously, uh, as a gang, I want to, you know, put up my limpy fist <laughs> on side with Disney <laughs> on this one. Uh, and so we are, in fact, you, you have me pegged, Charlie. I, I did not want to do this. Um, it is against my will. 
but we are making a stop by Disneyland actually See, in a couple uh, of weeks. Uh, in a couple see, of weeks, so okay, I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna confess. I have a kids I'm on... vacation. Brazil was an adult vacation. So okay, I've so got I, Disneyland I, on the. On I, I want to confess that I'm I am kind of a Disney fan. No, in my newsletter today I wrote, you know, the rights cancel culture comes for Disney, which I I just continue to find you know so interesting um, and ironic, paradoxical how um, these some of these guys can can just turn on a dime, go from the worst thing that we are faced with is cancel culture. Boom. Let's cancel Walt Disney Company. And you're having these boycotts. You have the attacks. Fox News, you turn it on. Um, look, folks, I, I know these some of these culture war things to take people by surprise because you're not sort of like looking over your shoulder at these guys. Um, this thing has exploded. It is sort of interesting that and I think you and I talked about it, you know, a couple of weeks ago. You know, we, we had, you know, the CRT. We had the drag queen story hour. And then there was the you know concern about trans. But the, the flex now is hardcore right at gay rights. The, the the bill that's passed in Florida, Disney comes out against it, says, hey, we're not we're not on board of this. And you turn on Fox every single show, uh, you know, wall to wall. People ask, that, well, what is the impact of the the story about um, uh, Donald Trump reaching out to Vladimir Putin for help? Uh, if you're watching Fox, all you're hearing about is Disney. It's just it's it's it Disney and and Christopher Rufo, the guy who pushed the CRT thing, the the sort of entrepreneur of culture war outrage, has has made the pivot and he's he's all in that we are waging a moral war against Disney because Disney is such a sinkhole of depravity, decadence, and wokeness. I guess I don't know. So bizarre. I mean, like I was joking earlier about about the gay villains, but like Disney, you know, it's not exactly been on the cutting edge of wokeness. I mean, they've, they're fine, whatever. I mean, the Disney movies I take my kid to are all, yeah, so, uh, you know, generally. I, so, so the idea that th- that this is this great evil is just on its face kind of preposterous. Um, this, but the, the, yeah, go oh, ahead. No, no, it's it just interesting. The moral war against the company that brought you Mary Poppins, Frozen, <laughs> Snow White, I mean, Encanto. Even the newer stuff, Encanto, right? Yeah, like, yeah. oh boy, I, it's so woke. Finding Nemo, Coco, ooh, Bambi, Cinderella, Ratatouille, The Lion yeah. King, <laughs> Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, Toy Story, The Princess and the Frog. Remember the Titans, the Mighty Ducks? <laughs> this is the These are the people that brought you Old Yeller. And 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 have subjected generations of parents to having to go on the "It's a Small World After All" ride. <laughs> <laughs> and if, but if we're just like, let's just talk about the newest stuff, right? I mean, who is a bigger representative of moral decadence in our culture, the Trump family or the Madrigals? You know, I mean, like the the whole point of the Madrigal family is about you know family values, extended family. You know, there's you know, frankly, kind of a moralistic matriarch who you know kicks out. I think Bruno. Speaking of gay characters, I think. Bruno might be gay, got kicked out of the family. Uh, you know, there's some familiar parallels there. Brought back into the fold. I, I you know, the whole thing is 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 silly and, and preposterous, but but it's also really pernicious and upsetting. And this is why, to your point about Fox. Yeah. I'm not trying to watch a lot of Fox these days, yeah. but I, I, I see the clips on Twitter. And I watched a little bit of my friend Megan Kelly's show the other day. She's not on Fox anymore, but she's got her own highly rated podcast. And the vi- the kind of cruelty and viciousness, yeah, I know. which with she and Greg Gutfeld and some of these other characters are talking about about the don't say gay bill in Florida, you know, and talking about Disney and talking about how absurd it is if you are to be pansexual and like if you're just going to have a birthing parent like, you know, is this even a real family if there's no uterus in the family? Our friend Red Steez was tweeting about this the other day, a picture of two gay dads like who yeah, wears the uterus that. in this yeah. family. Nice. And, and and so so this is why subtle, when we, you subtle. go back to yeah, really subtle. When you go back to yeah. my original article about the don't say gay bill. Uh, it, it is purposefully vague. One of the problems with it is it is purposely vague. For starters, it doesn't even talk about, you know, um, uh, sexual education. Like, like they, they all me- immediately move it to sex ed, uh, you know, but the, the, the bill doesn't even mention the word sexual education. It just talks about sexual orientation and gender identity. A- and, and so, you know, and then they go immediately to, well, the kid was thinking about transitioning and the parents, you know, d- were not supportive of that. And so in school... I, you know, but this was older kids, right? Like that has nothing to do with K3. What, what, what the actual bill talks about is K3, you, you cannot instruct on sexual orientation or gender identity. And, and so what does that mean exactly? It's hard to say. 
right? And, and so, and so, yeah, and so in some places, right, like the worst case scenario that someone like me might put out there for something you can't do might not end up coming to pass, right? But what we do know, what we're already seeing one week after the bill passes is the real implication. It's that people feel much more free and open to to spout like anti-gay and anti-trans rhetoric. Um, people feel free to insult like the no, the, the you know non-traditional families uh, you know like mine and degrade them and 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 talk about how wrong it is for kindergartners or first graders to have to hear about families like this. It leaves open the possibility that any sort of panhandle Karen who wants to sue their teacher and sue their school over over some book or some assignment that was handed out uh, now has carte blanche to do that. What do you think that, that impact is on on uh, is going to be on teachers in schools, particularly in conservative districts? Do, do you think that teachers are going to maybe not, uh, you know, be cautious and not mention the of fact course. that Toulouse has two gay dads, right? Because, oh, maybe I'll get in trouble. And that'll be instruction. And so I just think that, like, you know, like all of the waves out from this, you can see it was a totally unnecessary bill. It was solving a problem that doesn't really exist. And 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 the impact of it is now wall-to-wall cable news coverage of, you know, we're back in the 90s. We're back at don't ask, don't tell bullshit right now. It's it, we're, it we're, is we're way before crazy. the 90s, yeah. So kind of break this down. And I think you've, you've, you've done it, but I just kind of want to go back to it. They that some of the criticism of the bill, I think, was overblown because it's not a don't say gay bill. I mean, it, it, its sin is its vagueness, the fact that it doesn't really specify how it might actually be enforced. And the red flag is, as you just identified, this provision that allows any random parent to sue the school district if they think something that they don't like something. I mean, so you know, I am old enough to remember when conservative Republicans did not like the culture of litigation, when they did not want to encourage frivolous lawsuits. And as we all know, these lawsuits can uh, be time consuming. They can be incredibly costly, but they could also be yes. intimidating. So that, I think, is the uh, worst aspect of this law. Again, some of the criticism, I think, has been overblown. But, you know, you got me thinking, though about the uh, the other, maybe, okay, at, at, at the risk of being mocked here, the penumbra of these laws, that you have the actual language of the law, but then you also have what was the cultural impetus for? What is the motivation? And, and therefore, what is the climate that produced it and that it in turn produces? And I think you have described exactly. it. Because you now have this sense that one of the great threats to American culture right now is gayness and talking about gayness, which, by the way, is 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 really something that that I I maybe you think I'm naive. I thought we kind of moved past that. But I think that people ought to be aware the degree to which that we've almost moved. It's the trans issue is going to be around that. And I'm, I'm going to write about this. I do promise I'm going to get to this. But it's pivoted now to straight gayness. What I also think is interesting is why are we talking about Disney? We're talking about Disney because the company, under pressure from its employees, took a stand against the bill signed by Ron DeSantis. And the right now is all in on these kinds of culture war issues, and they're all in behind Ron DeSantis. So there is this massive attack on a private corporation, which includes not just the vilification that's going on here, not just the attempt to ruin the business. You know, Christopher Rufo, we are waging moral war against Disney. We are targeting their public reputation. We are turning half of their customers against them. This is the number one employer in the state of Florida, but also threatening legislative retaliation for this position. So, I mean, you have a lot of things that are going on beyond just the language of the legislation. And I think that that's also, I don't know that you can talk about it without talking about the kind of fallout from this legislation, but also kind of the bullying, the kind of, the kind of you know, DeSantis, you, you criticize something I've done as a private company, a private individual, a major employer, and I'm going to screw you. It's yeah, a dangerous I, time. No, no, it is. And, and that's exactly right. And I think this is unfortunately why Republicans have a little bit of a political advantage on this, right? They because do. the message of we don't want your kindergartner, you know, learning about, you know, 
sex change operations right. or whatever. Like that's a easy one sentence thing to th- say. It's BS. Obviously, kindergartens aren't learning about sex change operations anyway. But but you know, it's a one sentence thing to say that people that aren't following this closely, that don't have any stake in the game, people who don't have these kids already grown, you know, older folks who live in Florida, uh, kit people who you know don't have any gays and or you know transgender people in their lives, right? Like it's an easy one sentence thing. Whereas what we're talking about is much more ephemeral, right? Where it's like, well, the legislation doesn't say in it, well, this makes it okay for Fox News hosts to start talking about how how terrible non-traditional families are again, uh, or to start demonizing gay and uh, and gender non-conforming people. Um, but but that is that is an impact of it. So I you know I, I think you that know, that is hard. that is part of this you know political challenge. I, just really quick on to your point on yeah yeah yeah. Um, just really quick to your point on on the over criticism. I, I, the the original bill, just for people who haven't been following this as closely, like the original bill was actually even much, much worse. And the original much. bill did ban discussion right. in the classroom of, of sexual orientation and gender identity. And, and so I, I, I do think the don't say gay nomenclature was fair that when that was the language. Right now, they updated the bill. Um, the original bill also banned, uh, you know, or, or excuse me, didn't ban forced teachers to out kids. To their parents, which was a horrific provision that that also did get stripped out. I, I mentioned those two things because we now have a model, right? What's happening in Florida? You don't think that Christy Nome is going to try to copycat Ron oh, DeSantis and go absolutely. one step further? You don't think Greg Abbott, right? And so, I, so I mentioned those two provisions because I, they they might not be in the Florida bill anymore, but this is coming to South Dakota, to Arkansas, to Alabama. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, that, that uh, everywhere. I think is right. Yeah. Everywhere. Uh, uh, all these red states. So I think that is right to raise, raise a flag about. And, and, and I think that the kid, and that is who the most vulnerable people are. I, I, I don't think that at the end of the day, this bill is going to matter all that much in Fort Lauderdale. Right. Because I just, I don't think that the parents are going to sue and the schools like there's going to be much bit of a change to the curriculum these kids you know who come from you know non-traditional families have support structures there but what is happening you know what what do you what does everybody think is going to be the impact in the panhandle what do they think it's going to be in south dakota when um when when christy Nome passes her copycat legislation uh I, I, you know, that really does take us all the way back to the 70s, 80s, 90s, where these kids are afraid, they're made to be made afraid by bullies and, and people and people in power, you know, who want to make them feel like they're, you know, not normal, that they're other. Uh, and, and, and it's, and it's, it's, it's sick. And it, it's sick that, it, that, that it's happening. And it, and it all is to create this, to your point, phony culture war it is solving no problem at all right if you are a listener if you're you know one of the more more conservative listeners who are concerned about you know sort of gender identity discussion among kids uh, you could have a narrowly uh, you know bill I, i wouldn't have supported this bill but you could have had a narrowly written bill that's like you know, that, that talks about parental rights when it comes to kids and their gender identity, right? And, and, you know, making sure that the parents are on board if the kid, you know, if the kid was, you know, born, uh, you know, a man and decides they want to use the women's restroom or change their name or whatever, that the parents have to be involved in that decision. Uh, you know, I think that that's a complicated issue, you know, but that is a narrow issue. That is not what they're doing. This is a, this is a broad smear of, families and kids, you know, across a wide range of, of, of non-traditional, you know, gender identities and, and well, sexual orientations. Well, and I also think that there is that permission structure, um, which, which may sound like a wonky term, but there is that, that, that signal that goes out that says that, uh, you, you have permission to indulge in these attitudes and these behaviors. Yeah. And we've seen how that's played out in a variety of different contexts. And, um, this is a huge issue. And, you know, somebody asked me the other day, well, why is Ron DeSantis signing this bill? Why are they pushing this bill? And I said, well, because they think it is a political winner. They think the wind is at their back. They think, and you are going to see this at the school board level and the state level, as, as you point out. All right. So we have a lot. I just want to say uh, one more thing on yeah, transgender sure, folks really quick, sure. because they're yeah. just really quick, because it's easy to pick on them, right? Yeah. Because this is, this is to your point, a less yeah. popular, you know, like, especially with parents, less popular people, it's, it's new people are uncomfortable with it. Uh, but, but in the same way, you know, I, I wrote about, you know, gay parents in my family, you know, for some reason people forget this. There are also, you know, transgender parents, right, that have kids. So there are kids that are going into these schools who, who, who have a transgender parent and, 
they are, I think, the most vulnerable right now and being smeared by this the most. And 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 I just I, I think that's worth mentioning and, and talking about while you know there may be some some legitimate concerns about about kids you know I, I think there also need to be very legitimate fears about what about a, a child who comes from a family with with a transgender parent or a child who's dealing with that um and and what this imp, the impact of these kinds of bills are going to be on them i think it's going to be a i think it's going to be horrible i want to just change direction just a little sure. bit here um i mentioned before we started this i was really surprised when um, in, you know, coming through my feed yesterday was the latest Tim Miller, not my party, with a headline: <laughs> Biden lied about Hunter's laptop. Did not see that coming from you, Tim. So I want to get to that in just a moment. But just b- before we we get into that, because I think there's a lot of other cultural stuff I want to get to. Yeah. Um, I uh, sort of indirectly bandied words with Biden's chief of staff yesterday. Oh, yeah, really? Ron Klain was on, and when I say bandy, this doesn't mean a significant disagreement. It's just a a you know slight sure. you no know, the modification. I was on Nicole Wallace's show. You're on very frequently, uh, mm-hmm. and he was on right before I came on, and uh, I was on with Ann Applebaum and Katie Kay, who were fantastic and have written brilliant pieces. But he was asked about uh, Donald Trump reaching out to uh, Vladimir Putin for help digging up dirt on Joe Biden in the midst of a war. You know, this whole recapitulation of yeah. every single. Uh, you know, Russia scandal involving um, Donald Trump. And so Nicole Wallace asked Ron Klain, Biden's chief of staff, about that. And, and, and Klain said that was really disgusting. It was disgusting that he would do that, that he would think that that was appropriate at, you know, at a time when Vladimir Putin is committing war. Hey, that's fine. So you know, a few minutes later, I had a chance to weigh in on it because I'd been stewing about it. And you know, part of the problem, um, and I know that you've faced this as well because we're guys who work with words, that after six years of Donald Trump, um, you kind of run out of words to use yeah. to describe Donald Trump. And so, you know, disgusting is fine. But I say, you know, I just don't think disgusting is appropriate. I think that that understates it. I think when you have the former and perhaps future president of the United States saying things like that, it, it's not just disgusting. It is dangerous. It is dangerous to provide aid and comfort to someone like a Vladimir Putin. It is dangerous. And I mean this in the most literal possible way to uh, su- even, you know, you know, suggest it to Vladimir Putin that if he just waits all of this out, that maybe Donald Trump will make it all go away. Um, it's not just disgusting because Donald Trump is disgusting, you know, it's on any day that ends with why. But when he continues to appease uh, Vladimir Putin right now in this circumstance, while this carnage is going on, while he is committing acts of genocide, it's a fundamental betrayal. I called it treason yesterday. I don't mean the literal definition of treason, but I mean, I mean the the the, the treason against uh, you know this country, the decency, a betrayal of our values, uh, the way that that uh, Trump po- posed it. When he said, well, you know, I think that Vladimir Putin might release this dirt on uh, on the Bidens because he doesn't much like this country right now. So he made it very clear that it was not just for him. It was not just an attack on Biden. It was an attack on the country. And look, you know, there are a lot of people out there, mouth breathers out there who say stupid things. But Donald Trump is the odds on favorite to be the Republican nominee for president. He was the president. When he says things like that, it has real world consequences. So disgusting or inappropriate just doesn't quite capture it. So I kind of pushed back and I thought that Ron Klain should use a stronger word. Uh, I just think, one uh, sentence I think it's on dangerous. this. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. so we talk about unprecedented blah 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 during the Trump era. This yeah, yeah. is why you know it's hard to come up with. It's but not like, normal. This this no. is literally <laughs> without historical precedent. Certainly uh, since the Civil War, right? Like right. in this country, for to have a, a a former president, a party leader, you know, offer treasonous aid and comfort to uh to a, a military foe yeah. that is currently attacking an ally, uh, committing war crimes, Uh I mean, there, there you cannot, you can just go back through, I guess, Lindbergh, right? But Lindbergh no. was never actually the president, right? He wasn't actually a nominee, right? Like you can, you just go back into the modern times and there's nothing even in, in the ballpark of, of this. Um, j- no. So I, just to, to emphasize your point. That, that was my point. Okay. Yeah. So since we, we mentioned uh, Joe Biden, yeah. you, right. Biden lied about Hunter's laptop. I don't think we've ever discussed Hunter's laptop. So go. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I just, for what it's worth, um, I was ha- I was happy that people went there with the headline. I didn't write the headline, so I was surprised like you were when it came across. I was like, all right, we're going there. Great. Yeah. I did say it in the Not My Party in the video. People can watch the video. I, I, I try to just be fair about the Not My Party video. And 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 I'm really mindful of Not My Party because as much as it's great for our Bulwark super fans who enjoy it, which I appreciate, like the real audience for it is is younger folks, you know, who I, I think are just yearning for political news. Every, everybody that I hear from that DMs me about it, like, is like, I, I just, I don't know who to trust, right? Like all of the, the lefty stuff is just so, so out of control. You know, I, I obviously can't listen to Ben Shapiro and Charlie Kirk. And so it's like, who do I listen to? And so right. I, I, I try to st- shoot him straight. And so on the Hunter, I wanted to shoot him straight on this Hunter thing, which is, which is number one, I, I you know, the personal side of it is is really gross, and it's gross that that Republicans have tried to use it. And he has a, he's a guy with a drug problem, and his dad stuck with him. And you know this this computer just really reveals that. Honestly, in a lot of ways, it reveals Joe Joe Biden as a very caring father, right? Who who I think is struggling with with her son, and you have to have empathy for that. There's the political part to the scandals, right? Quote unquote scandals, which is Hunter Biden cashing in on his access. This is gross. But also kind of standard, right? It's like a standard mm. level of gross. It's normal political scandal. This is not to excuse it, but 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 that is what it is, with the exception of the the China deal, you know, where there's the famous line about how there's 10H for the big guy. Uh, that I think that merits more looking into. It might be something. It might really be nothing. It was in 2017 when Biden was a private citizen. I don't know that he was even planning on running again at that point. So he was allowed to do deals with his kid where he got 10, mm-hmm. 10%. Uh, you know, but 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 if he did, then bad. again, he would have lied about it. Yeah, he would have lied about it because because that has been he's been asked about that and, and said it was Russia disinformation. We'll get to that. So the two real bad things that we know are bad about the Hunter situation is one, the way the media and the big tech companies reacted to it. And, and I'm so, I understand we talked about this a little bit on the live stream that 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 we people didn't want to make the same mistake as 2016, where the media way overplayed these Russian hacks, and, and you don't want to incentivize bad actors to hack, you know, a, a, a domestic politicians. I totally get that. I totally get why Wall, Wall Street Journal didn't write the article, but but the problem is when you take it a step further and going from from hey we're going to be cautious about this information to hey we are going to ban people from looking at it and we're going to smear this as russian disinformation without really knowing whether or not it was russian disinformation and and and, and i think this plays into the grievances that 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 people on the right have about about the way that the media and big tech companies deal with them in a way that's bad. I think that this made the story worse because it added into it the censorship aspect of it. Uh, this New York Post article being on Twitter, like people already could have seen it anyway, right? So censoring it, I think that was a big mistake. Censoring news bad. is very different from censoring hate speech. If you want to censor hate speech or porn or whatever on your platform, I'm all for it. You can read my Getter article I wrote about my support for censorship. Censoring news is different. Last point on this is Joe Biden did lie about this. I I mean, I I just don't know how there's any other way to put it. He's asked on the campaign about this multiple times. He always said this was Russian disinformation. Let's just be honest. It was clear it wasn't Russian disinformation at the time. Anybody who is looking at it in a fair-minded way could say maybe this was a Russian hack. And that's worth saying. Maybe it was a Russian hack and we shouldn't overstate it. But the information was obviously real. It wasn't like it was a deep fake pictures of of Hunter Biden. It was his real emails. And so Biden, in order to kind of get a shield of protection from this during the campaign, didn't tell the truth. And, you know, you don't that's just reality. Now, is that as bad as all the times Trump lied? Blah, blah, blah. Is Hunter Biden as bad as Jared Kushner? No, I've written a million articles about the graft of Jared Kushner and Donald Trump and the Trump organization and their deals in Turkey. And, you know, I, I've written about this. I, I don't think it compares, but that doesn't make it not a thing. No, I say I agree. And I mean, you sort of walk through, you know, the the, the known knowns here. I mean, first of all, yeah, to your, to your last point, people are going, well, what about what about the, uh, the, the Trump kids? OK, we know about the Trump kids. Um, we have been talking about the Trump kids for the last uh, four or five years. Republicans who have looked the other way really don't have much standing now to say, well, now Hunter Biden is uh, is relevant. Uh, Hunter Biden is not a member of the White House staff. He did not have any of the positions of the power that were given to Ivanka and Jared Trump, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's all true. But then we come to us because we have said that there was something deeply wrong with that nepotism. And the reality is that Hunter Biden 
and this is where I'm, I'm, I wrestle because I, I think that Hunter Biden is a damaged individual. Yeah. I think that the picture we get of him is he is very skeezy and very, very sleazy, but also very damaged. He's obviously, you know, had some serious drug problems. I don't know what other, you know, problems he has, but he's not an admirable figure. And I would definitely not uh, support him for president. And I would not suggest <laughs> that, that he be given a role in the administration in any way whatsoever. But I think it's a mistake to engage in the kind of whataboutism that we deplored when it was uh, when it was deployed by the other side. The other point that you just made about the media censoring this story during the campaign is I hope people realize how much damage that has done. This has fed, this has supercharged the narrative about censorship. It has supercharged the narrative about the media being completely unreliable because it took sides in all of this. The job of the media is not to engage in cover-ups on behalf of any politician. So this is a uniquely awful moment, I think, for the media. And the damage it has done to the credibility will be long-lasting. People will be citing this for, I want to say, decades. Um, I think it's going to become legendary. And can I just chime in on, because there's the JVL point on this, which I think is well taken, which is like, okay, the people who are mad about the media being unfair, we're going to be mad no matter what. I, and and there is a group that that that, that yeah, covers true. right like there is a group that does it doesn't matter what the truth is they're going to say the media was unfair to the democrats and and you know they're they're going to come up with whatever fake grievances that they need to come up with and they're going to lie about things and you know molly Hemingway is never going to be happy right I, I i agree with that bad faith uh, but but this is this kind of transcended that right and there are casuals so. you know there are casuals out there there is another category of people who are not very online you know, who, who maybe have some sympathies to the right, but, you know, are gettable types of voters who look at this and they hear all of the bad faith arguments that come from the right, you know, that that is in part of the, you know, eco soup that they swim in when it comes to the political dialogue. They hear that. And, and, and this example is one that makes them say, yeah, these guys actually are right. So, in fact, I, I think that this empowers the bad faith. I think it does. You know what I mean, I right? Because, I know, because exactly. your casual people right. no. like listen to this and say, wow, those guys had a point on this one. So, anyway, I, it was just no. a massive error. And, and I don't think, yeah. the last, last thing, I, if they'd covered the story, it wouldn't have mattered. Like the Hunter bite, you know, the, the details of it are not really that bad. I, you know, they're bad for Hunter, but they're not bad yeah. for Joe. They're certainly not any worse than what would have, than what the Trump had happened. So, so, so they try. So, anyone who who thought they were putting their thumb on the scale to be helpful, actually did the opposite. I think you. I I think you're right. So here's something that I've actually avoided talking about at all on the show. Okay. But the more I think about it, the more I do think that there's you know that we need to uh, deal with it. And you dealt with it in your uh, not my party, which was of course the slap. That everybody else has, <laughs> that everybody else has has talked about uh, um, Will Smith slapping Chris Rock. I actually held off on it for a couple of days because, in the back of my mind, this is how deep in the rabbit holes I've gotten. I'm thinking, what if it turns out it was staged? What if it turns out that it was fake? So you know, don't 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 engage in heavy breathing. I think it's apparent by now that it was not staged. That that you had one of the biggest superstars in the world jump up on the stage and slap the shit out of Chris Rock for telling a joke that he thought was um, unduly offensive and insulting to his wife. I mean, you know, life recommendations, if you're going to make fun of somebody's wife, um, maybe give them a heads up um, and probably do not make fun of a medical condition she has. But in any case, I, so give me how you break this down, because I there are two really, really awful takes on this that I want to address <laughs> afterwards. You know? I noticed that you skipped over the one part of the Not My Party where we disagree, which is about how how great Joe Biden's doing on Ukraine. So that's OK. That's OK. I noticed you just skipped over that. It was a three take episode. Uh, we'll do the slap first. Um, my response, I, firstly, I also was like, this can't be real when it was, kind of, I, we had given yeah. up on the Oscars. I was getting bored right. by them. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's for another day. Uh, and I think we'd moved to, I think, a rerun of RuPaul's Drag Race since we'd been on vacation mm -hmm. uh, instead. And we we're catching up on that. And so I saw it on my Twitter um, and I was like, this can't be real. And then, I, you know, I saw my friend David Mack uh, at BuzzFeed uh, uh, was in Australia. And so he he aired the Australian version. And I was like, oh, wait, this is real. Like the uncensored version. <laughs> I was like, wait, this is definitely real, actually. This, by this the way, is exactly how I watched. This is exactly <laughs> the same way that I saw it. Go on. <laughs> I would say, 
anyway, the and the now I party I just wanted to cover there were two reactions and and we'll we'll just sort of generally put them in our political tribes, unfortunately, because that's how our society works these days. But but you know, there's some overlap. One is the tough guy response, which is that, you know, a man needs to stand up for their woman. <laughs> like this is, yeah. you know, like we're in the old West here. I think it was Larry Wilmore who who made this argument, which is that actually really disempowers Jada for me, right? I, I mean, A, grown-ass men shouldn't be putting hands on anybody no matter, no, you know, no matter right. the situation, unless they put hands on you first or on your family. But but that disempowers Jada. Jada's a strong woman, right? She didn't need Will Smith to go up there and slap Chris Rock. Uh, she has a big microphone. She could have made fun of Chris Rock herself or insulted his hair or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, she had pl- there are plenty of options for for that, for her to be able to to react to this. So that 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 is just number one. I, I think that that is that is a this sort of toxic masculinity, you know, anti-feminist view that you saw from a lot of folks. That was bullshit. The other one though is people get so wrapped up in the identity stuff right now. And you can oh, see I how can. this goes awry. And I like, look, I am, I've written about this a bunch. I, I'm kind of a, an identitarian squish. I think that representation matters, all this sort of stuff. But when you get into, you know, I think it was a congressman, it was Jamal Bowman, I think, or maybe Ayanna Presley, maybe both of them, you know, who, who tweeted like, this is what you get when you talk about a black woman's hair. Like, again, I guess kind of true, but like, this doesn't have anything to do with that. Right. Uh, you know, you can't get so wrapped up into all these things where, you know, if you're, you know, whichever, you know, if the gays are insulted, you know, in a, in, that means that I get to go smack Ron DeSantis across the face. Right. Like, I'd love to smack Ron DeSantis across the face, but I don't do that because we're adults and this is a society. And 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 I worry about the horseshoe part of this. Right. Where where there's oh, yeah. certain parts of the identitarian left that are like, oh, yeah. well, it's not because of the tough. It's not because the man protecting this woman. It's because of this insult insult of something that's core to our identity that makes it okay like no it's not okay it's not okay in either case okay so here here, here i and i we're gonna have radical agreement here um yeah. there there were two really bad takes on this i mean the the first is the the justification of of an act of assault i mean i, I it, it you know i do this in a bar uh somebody's gonna call the cops on me it's it's you're, you're not supposed to be you know hitting somebody because of something that they said this is the dangerous part. If you break it down, let's assume I'm going to you know, stipulate that what he said was offensive. So when someone says something offensive, does it justify an act of physical violence? When you break it down like that, you see how dangerous the precedent is, because there are a lot of people who will hear things that offend them or insult them that should not see that as a justification for physical violence, because as you just pointed out, that could play out in a lot of different ways and a lot of different venues. And then to your point about identity politics, the worst takes that I saw, what I think was, was one woman who tweeted, I was going to you know, you know express my opinion. And then I looked at my hands and saw that I am a white woman. And therefore I do not have a right to have an opinion about all of this. Like, whoa, what? This sort of, we want to talk about the ultimate of identity politics that you've reduced your humanity and your judgment strictly to your race, essentially saying, I'm sorry, we should not judge these people. I mean, come on, you know, other people. I think actually that was the second worst take because the worst yeah, take okay. was also related to identity politics, but on the other side, which was Jesse Waters on Fox, who was saying that this is the first time the media has covered black on black crime. Yeah. And like if a white man had hit Chris Rock, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's the same thing, say, you know, other other side of the coin. Okay, so um, since we had a radical agreement on uh, that, let's talk about Will Hurd, because okay. of all the things going on in the world, you drop down from a great height. <laughs> Writer for the Bulwark, slapping Will Hurd for saying, you know, we need principled Republicans <laughs> who will pursue an identity of decency. And you wrote a whole piece yeah. called I Will didn't. Hurd's Dangerous mm-hmm. Wish Casting. His shiny mm-hmm. dreams depend on a GOP that don't exist. Now, let me just read you a, a, the, the passage. And again, this is based on Tim Alberta's deep dive article in The Atlantic that suggests that Will Hurd, former congressman from Texas, Republican congressman from Texas, might actually think of running for um, president as a Republican, which is kind of new. So Hurd's got a new book, and uh, you quote this uh, critique of the GOP. Hurd writes, Republicans have become comfortable saying or doing anything to win an election. The party of family values champions cruel 
policies and hateful politicians while lecturing the left on morality. The party of fiscal discipline and personal responsibility blows holes in the budget, then blames Democrats for their recklessness. The party of empowerment and opportunity systematically attempts to disenfranchise voters who are poor and non-white. The party of freedom and liberty keeps flirting with authoritarianism. Yeah. Okay, so Tim Miller. I agree with all that. What? Yeah, so what's your fucking problem with Will Hurd? <laughs> I agree with all that. My fucking problem with Will Hurd is that there's a whole group of other people that agree with that. They're called Joe Biden voting Democrats. <laughs> okay? So, like, this is... My problem with Will Hurd is that in order to advance this whole, like, moral high horse, high ground a position that, that, he, that he wants to advance in the Atlantic article... Uh, the, uh, there is an undergirding fact that is not an evidence, which is that his positions are also not acceptable in the Democratic Party. And, and that's just not true. I don't like that's just not true right now. I mean, the, the Will Hurd's critique of the Democrats. Well, let's just to your point. Will Hurd's critique of the Republicans is that they're cruel, uh, flirting with authoritarianism, anti-democratic. They're liars. They're profligate. Okay. His criticism of the Democrats is that they, they've, they're going to extreme on anti-energy policies and on defunding the police. Okay, You know who agrees with that set of opinions? Like half of the Democrats. Like your median Plano Democrat in Texas agrees oh, wait, with that. Wait, wait, so we, that we the Republicans all, so are we, crazy. Okay, no, I don't, so think, I don't it, think we all have to be Democrats. Okay. I'm not saying that everybody has to be a Democrat. I'm just saying that, that, uh, that, that he is advancing a lie which is that the Republicans are, are crazy and that the Democrats are crazy for these two different sets of reasons. And so I'm going to try to fix this by running as a Republican. But, but like, that's not, that's not true. Will Hurd, Will Hurd yeah. is sending a signal to the voters who agree with him that, that the Democrats are not their party either, that they should be Republicans. But that's just not true. This is a fantasy. There are, there are no Republicans. Uh, Will Hurd's the I'm... base of Republicans who want to vote for Will Hurd, for somebody who thinks that Republicans are cruel and profligate and that Donald Trump should have been impeached. That, that's about, that's like 1% of the party. The, ba the group of Democrats who well, believe that, that who larger. believe that it's like 3%. The group of Democrats who believe that the Republicans are profligate and liars, but that also that the squad is crazy. That's like 45% of the Democratic Party. So like, let's be smart. Let's okay. let's use okay, your, okay. your strategy. Let me, let me, let me, let me explain like, why, let's why, be strategic. why you're... Yeah, okay. So let me tell you where I agree and I disagree. I mean, obviously, I think Will Hurd is, your headline is uh, Will Hurd's dangerous wish casting. I do agree he's wish casting. There's no question about it. I mean, we've talked about this. I mean, the can the Republican Party be saved? Uh, highly, highly un unlikely. But I guess where I disagree with you on is the idea that it is dangerous. I think I think it's important because we need two sane uh, political parties in this country. And look, um, do I think that he's going to succeed? No. Um, do I agree with everything he says? No, I don't. But are we going to be dropping now? I mean, is is this kind of going to be the thing that that every time, you know, some decent Republican comes out and says, hey, yeah, I think the Republican Party should be more decent. We'll go no. You will hurt slap. You no, know, <laughs> you governor of Maryland slap. Liz Cheney, you should get out and you should become a, a, a Democrat. You know, look, he's he's walking the walk. He's going to put himself out there. He's I don't walk in the walk. I, I, he's going to run. He's going to put himself out there. Which but is more why? Why not? Why not run against Greg Abbott? Why not do something useful? Why not do something that has okay. a chance of success? Why not look at, you know, his whole pitch in this article to, to, to Tim Alberta is we should be serious. We should be rigorous. We should look at the data and make decisions. We, but, should, but, but, care, but, we shouldn't care about anti-racist well, baby. Are we going to crap on principled republic? We've spent, what is the point of the bulwark? I mean, I thought it was we are going to be supporting center-right and center-left people who will stand for democratic values and everything. Yeah, I'll tell you. He's standing yeah. for democratic values, and you're saying, go, you know, no, you need to be a Democrat. No, I mean, what's, I, like, what's I'm the saying Will Hurd. I'm saying Will Hurd needs to be a Democrat. I'm not saying that everyone who's decent needs <laughs> no, to be. I'm saying Will Hurd is a Democrat. I mean, no, he can not. lie. He can pretend like he's not. No, no. Will if you ran down the issues, there. you ran down the issues, he yeah. can lie to himself. I'm not saying he's lying to others. But like, if you run down Will Hurd's set of positions, like he's Abigail Spanberger. He's not. So look, Jamie Herrera Butler in Washington. Yeah, this is. I love Jamie Herrera Butler. Me and her disagree on a lot of things on Donald Trump. She's more far to the right to me. She voted to impeachment. She's mm. a principled person. Mm. She's running against an insane mm. MAGA. I think yeah. Jamie Herrera Butler is doing exactly the right thing. I'm happy that she's running. 
Okay. Well, uh, wait. Uh, you know, I here's the thing. Did, I thought she didn't exist. I thought anybody that said people like Jamie Herrera Butler are lying. Didn't you just say that? Didn't you say there's only one percent of people who actually yeah. take these positions when, in fact, they do exist? But, but you know, Jamie Herrera Butler's not like Will Hurd. She's a strong. She's a, she's a far right conservative who voted who made one good vote on impeachment. Like that's what Jamie Herrera Butler is, and and then she's running against an insane MAGA person. So like who who, who like is pro Putin. So and 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 spoke to a white nationalist conference. So I look, you have to be strategic. They're different things. Will Hurd in Texas, he is a Texas Democrat. His positions are indistinguishable from other Texas Democrats. And so if he says no, the Democrats are too crazy. So I have to still be a Republican, even though the party has thoroughly rejected me. That sends a signal to other Texas voters who are like, well, I guess I should be with Greg Abbott too. If, if Will Hurd is in Greg Abbott's party, I didn't hear him criticize Greg Abbott in there. I listened to his National Review podcast. I didn't hear him criticize the the Republican Party uh, you know, in, in Texas. He is a he's running cover for them right now. And, and he's creating a permission structure for people who think like him to vote for crazy, anti-democratic, authoritarian uh, people. So here's the thing, Charlie, you might not like this. Will yeah, you heard. Just really quick, let me finish this. You might not Will, like Will this. Heard. That, yeah. But the, the, a, a sane, a quote unquote sane Republican that wins a primary in 2024 looks like Glenn Youngkin, not like Will Hurd. And, 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 and so, and so here's the thing. I, I don't, I'm not going to support Glenn Youngkin for a variety of reasons. But if, if, if Glenn Young, is Glenn Youngkin better than Donald Trump? Hell yeah. Will I tell people that Glenn Youngkin is better than Donald Trump? Hell yeah, because that would be a real actual effort to win a Republican primary. What Will Hurd is doing is wish casting bullshit. And, 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 he, and, and he doesn't have the balls to say the truth about, about where he is in our current democratic system. He's a well, red he dog the, he, Democrat. He has a different view. And there are those of us that don't want to consider ourselves red dog Democrats because we don't want to engage in that kind of travel. Would you say the same thing about Larry Hogan, the governor of Maryland? Who also no, he's a blue ex- state exists. governor. This is a different thing. He's a blue state. That's what I'm, I'm talking about being smart, Charlie. I'm talking about being strategic. He's a blue state governor. If, if, if Will Hurd lived in California and said he wanted to run for governor uh, next time, I'd be like, okay, great. Will Hurd, I, you're probably going to lose that race, but that makes sense. That's a sensible thing. Okay. To run yeah. for president in 2024 is madness. It's, it's not, it's, it's hopeless. Yeah, but that's it's it, like that's worse than hopeless. Yeah, I, Okay, you know what? See, my my approach is people who want to side with decency and democratic values. I'm going to welcome them. I'm going to encourage them. If you are one of the good guys, I'm not going to beat you up because of that. Because there's plenty of other people who will beat him up. There'll be plenty of other people who are going to, you know, crap on him. Um, and I understand that that means that I'm going to have some, you know, squishy things. But I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I am going to, you know, say nice things about. I, you know, again, again, does Larry Hogan have a chance of winning the nomination? Absolutely not. You know, um, am I going to call him dangerous for thinking that he should run for president? No. You know what? If the guy's going to stand up and he's going to do the right thing, you know, at some point we need to stand and say, you may lose, it may be hopeless, but I think you're doing the right thing. Okay, Haven't I mean, and again, through this? isn't this insanity? Haven't we lived through this? We didn't we do this already with Joe Walsh and with Mark Sanford? Didn't we do this with uh, John Huntsman? Haven't we done this? Like, like no, you did it with John what, Huntsman. Yeah, I, maybe this is why, because I, I have PTSD. Because we finished in last place. I did this already. I, I just like we've already done this, Charlie. Like, I just what's want the point of continuing I, to do I, it. So I want these voices out there, and I want them to be taken seriously. Uh, so, hey, hey, for listeners of this, we think that this is a little bit contentious. So, <laughs> um, so we have Tim Miller dumping on Will Hurd um, on Friday. On Monday's podcast, we will have Tim Alberta, who wrote the story about Will Hurd in the Atlantic. So it'll be a little Tim on Tim action. I love Tim Alberta, by the way. He's yeah. a gimlet-eyed optimist, dewy-eyed but he, optimist. But he's not, he's actually. That's a, See, I, this is what I want to talk to him about, because in, in many ways— the body of his work has been chronicling the incredible disillusionment. I mean, remember he wrote the story about Nikki Haley, yeah, where yeah, she was really like for five minutes going stepping away from Donald Trump. And then, of course, she screwed right back on there. And then he wrote that really extraordinary piece about Peter Meyer from uh, Michigan, yeah. one of the Republicans who voted to impeach Trump, who had been totally crushed and ground down and just reduced to this puddle of gelatin. And it was like so. That, that's what's interesting about Tim Alberta's piece, because he's seen this happen, you know, over and 
over again. <laughs> These guys are crushed, you know, into dust. And I'm, I want to know why he's, you know, thinks that will the Will Hurd thing will be any different or why he would treat the Will Hurd thing any differently. I mean, I, I'm, I'm genuinely interested in knowing what his take is on that because I don't think that he's a wild-eyed optimist. <laughs> I think he's hopeful. We'll see. I'm happy to listen to him. You can play it. He can t- he can dunk on me. Me and Alberta are good. Um, I, he, great yeah. reporter, wonderful writer, and uh, I I thought that he was a little too um, uh, just just allowing for for Will Hurd's fantasies and and, and could have punctured it a little it, could have punctured it a little more. It's called hope. He, he just he kept the door open. I, to hope. I he, also have hope. But by the way, you're making me all negative. Here's what I'm saying: Will Hurd could be hopeful. He could he could actually challenge. Who would you rather have right now running against Greg Abbott as governor of Texas? Beto, who has no chance to win. I also trashed on Beto, by the way, who I like. Beto's a nice yeah, guy, right, and, and right. Uh, you know, I, I, and and I trashed on him because I'm a pragmatist. I'm talking about what is strategically smart, we would be much better off. If Beto was in the Biden administration helping him with messaging because they could use it, and Will Hurd was running against Greg Abbott and saying that, look, I'm still conservative on you know, energy and the border and defunding the police, but the party is becoming anti-authoritarian and, and we need somebody who can actually beat Greg Abbott. And so me, as a, a person of color, I, yeah. I'm going to, uh, former Republican, I'm going to challenge Greg Abbott. That's fantasy politics, I guess, but that, that actually is a chance of winning. OK, that that, that I can see is that. how a decent person gets into the arena and says, OK, I can do something good. I, what what this is, is vanity, in my opinion, running for president as a Republican, because that's not uh, going to happen. It, 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 it certainly seems like a long shot. So, you know, I mean, look, you and I have a, like a slightly different perspective because yeah, okay. you're you, no, no, you're you're in the arena. You know, you've been a consultant. You've been involved in these campaigns where I am content to sit, you know, in the far upper, you know, rows of the bleachers going <laughs> Good, good on, good on. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, one last thought: it's CBS hiring Mick Mulvaney as a paid contributor. What I've, are they thinking? I don't like that. No, but I mean, what are I know they what even thinking. thinking? What access? Access. So, so I, I'm going to answer the question you asked, which is, "What are they thinking?" Yeah. Okay. Uh, because obviously, for me, fuck all these guys forever. I yeah. told my husband one day, I was like, "I'm going to be that guy in the senior citizens' home." You know, or someone's going to come on TV and they're going to be like, that was, you know, this person did a nice thing today. And I'd be like, uh-uh, they were for Trump. <laughs> you know, That guy was for Trump. I'm going to be wagging my old finger at him. Be like, I can't give that person. I'm not going to wheel over there and talk to that person at the cafeteria. That person was for Trump, I remember. Uh, so I, I, I give no quarter to these people. I, I am already here, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> here's, 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 here's the problem. Though. If you're a CBS, like, what are you supposed to do? I, I honest, I, this is a, this is an honest question. Hire no Republican. I mean, maybe maybe you just give up having political contributors uh, from either party. All right, because you, there is nobody to have. I mean, there's nobody to have. You, what you can hire Adam Kinzinger, I guess. You can hire Charlie Sykes. But like, are, are are either of them really representing the party? You can hire my friend Will Hurd, right? Uh, but but if you want to actually really represent the party, and if you're a news organization and you want to say what does what are the Republicans really thinking? Don't you need to hire actual Republicans? So I, no. for me, their mistake is like hiring him as a pundit, right? Because it's like, who yeah. cares what, what lying Mick Mulvaney thinks about the Joe Biden tax plan or whatever. But, but as far as reporting, right, I, I, I understand how they feel like they need to get some sort of insight into what's happening in the Republicans that might be helpful to hire Republicans. And because of Trump, you know, anyone who's in good standing is tainted by that. And so what do you do? You're stuck kind of, right? No, I see. I, I, I think it's part of it's the category uh, mistake is that you actually need to have someone who represents the party in order to give insight, because what you're doing is you're hiring a political hack who will give you a spin. How about That's hiring right. people who will actually provide insight, who will give you information, who will give you an honest opinion who are not compromised in that particular way. This whole tradition of, of, of hiring, you know, basically political activists to be, and this happens on all the networks, political activists or actors to be uh, pundits. What is the point of that? If you want to find out what Republicans think, you interview them. You don't necessarily have to put them on the payroll. You should put people on the payroll who know stuff and who will tell the truth. And obviously, Mick Mulvaney is not going to be doing that. I don't think couldn't have a more passionate agreement. You're exactly right. Okay, all right. right. 
Tim Miller, it is great to have you back um, in this country and great to have you back on the podcast. Have a great weekend. Thanks, brother. Good to have you. Peace. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast. And we'll be back tomorrow. We'll do this all over again. juggling life, a career, and trying to build a little bit of wealth. The Brown Ambition Podcast with host Mandy and Tiffany the Budget Nista can help with special guest Chris Browning. You know, I'll give a shout out. I have two co-workers Mandy who love your podcast. They found out about me podcasting because of the last time I was on on your podcast That's Brown it. Ambition. <laughs> we outed you. Yeah, you did. So <laughs> spread it out a little bit further. Chances are if you work in an office with black women, Brown Ambition <laughs> is somewhere. Brown Ambition. Listen, wherever you get your podcast, wherever you get your podcast 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 wherever